Well, for the second week of July, it's been an unusually busy week in politics. There was a rare sitting of a House of Commons committee to examine the government's controversial prostitution bill. As we mentioned earlier in that doc, it would make buying sex illegal. But the Justice Minister said what he'd like to see is all-out abolition. The government recognizes that Bill C-36 vision of a society free from prostitution's harms will take time to realize and that some will remain subjected to prostitution while this transformation is underway. Meantime, the political heat of the summer barbecue season was also turned way up as Stephen Harper targeted Justin Trudeau at his Calgary stampede speech. Justin Trudeau was recently asked, some of you may have heard this, what country and what government he admires most? He said, China's. Really? The reason Justin Trudeau, my point is this, the reason Justin Trudeau didn't want to answer that question, because the answer right now is obvious. The best country and the best government in the world is right here. And finally, with Rob Ford back at work in Toronto on the campaign trail, it didn't take long for yet another controversy to bubble up. All right, we'll get to that in just a few minutes. But to talk about all these issues, we've gathered Jennifer Ditchburn of the Canadian Press, John Iveson of the National Post, both in Ottawa tonight, and Tasha Carradine, a columnist with the National Post, and iPolitics is in Toronto. Good to see all three of you here. All right, uh, Jennifer, let me start with you, and we'll, we'll start on the prostitution bill in the hearings this week. What do you make of the government's position, and Peter McKay's, some have called it a hardline position, to, a, to try to abolish prostitution altogether? Well, you know, I, I think you could say that, that that's appealing to the Conservative Party's base to say, look, we want to we want to do away with. Uh, what's, he said it's aspirational, so I think even he acknowledged that it, it, they didn't think they were going to abolish prostitution altogether. But this whole bill, uh, you have to remember that the Supreme Court sort of forced them into dealing with this. Uh, I'm sure that they would have rather not had to delve into the issue of prostitution at all. And also, it's not really a cut and dry policy issue. Uh, you're not just dealing with, uh, you know, we're going to crack down on prostitution. You're also dealing with difficult issues that um, involve women and girls, Aboriginal people. Um, so I think while, you know, you, you're hearing some language that's strong, like let's, let's get rid of prostitution altogether, you know, they're, they're, they're having to, to ride a fine line. They want to make sure that they're, they're sounding like they're addressing the needs of women and, and, and the girls that are being um, oppressed by the prostitution system or, or being hurt by this. Tasha, where are you on this one? Well, I think the Conservatives have styled themselves as defenders of the victims of crime. And in this case, they are adopting, interestingly enough, um, a, a line that many feminists adopt, which is that women in the sex trade are victims. They're not there by choice. They are being uh, hurt, in some cases trafficked. Uh, women and girls are the losers in this equation. And at the same time, they are, as Jennifer said, appealing to their base, which sees this as a moral issue. So they're on both sides of the spectrum. But I think in terms of their base, I think what this issue does for them actually Actually, yes, they were forced into it in a sense, but it does allow them to play the moral high ground on another issue, um, which is marijuana, in the same sort of vein, i.e., we are the government of morality, we are the government of law and order, we are the government that stands up for good middle-class families in every sense of the word, and they shouldn't be smoking pot and going and seeing prostitutes. So, you know, it, it's kind of consistent with their line. It is a hard line, but it, like I said, it appeals to constituencies on different sides of the spectrum, so I think it works for them. John, is it about politics or something more? Well, we, we talk about it being a hard line, but I think uh, in some ways it was a compromise. I mean, Peter McKay talked about abolition. They could have gone all the way to abolition. They could have tried to uh, criminalise prostitution. They didn't do that. Uh, they're criminalising instead the, the, the Johns and the Pimps. Uh, the other side of the Conservative Party, the Libertarians, wonder why the government's involved at all. So this was a, a bit of a compromise. Um, I think they know that they're on uh, dodgy legal ground as far as uh, be, it being constitutional. Um, it looks to me like the thing will, will, there will be challenges, but of course that will take two or three years before mm -hmm. it gets to the Supreme Court. But again, I don't think the, uh, the Liberals or the NDP have come out clearly on the side of legalising. They don't want to be seen mm -hmm. as being soft on prostitution or pro-prostitution either. So this is a matter which I think all parties will be happy that the Supreme Court ultimately decides upon, although it will be two or three years down the line. Uh, as you say, John, maybe they're happy to win in the election cycle if that's what they believe this does and lose in the courts. That's another issue. Mm -hmm. One curious thing, let me just point this out before we move along. 
Here's a clip that made a lot of controversy from Robert Gauguin, he's the parliamentary secretary to the Minister of Justice. He testified at that committee this week on Parliament Hill. And he was asking questions of a witness who had testified that she had been raped. Here's what he said to her. Check this out. You were being raped, I believe, by three Russians. Uh, let's suppose the police authorities would have broken in and rescued you. Would your uh, freedom of expression have been any way breached? Jennifer, a lot of people commented on this, thinking that was an inappropriate question. The witness was actually confused by it. What do you make of that? Well, you know, to give him the benefit of the doubt, I think it was a ham-fisted way of get, getting to a point. But I think what it demonstrated, what that clip demonstrates, is this broken committee system that we have, where uh, oftentimes MPs show up at committees, and they're not actually there to get to the heart of an issue. They're there to score political points. Sometimes they're cheap political points at the expense of one another. Uh, and, you know, it, it, you find sometimes witnesses are either chalked up as friends or enemies. It, it gets into sort of a, a really kind of... Um, uh, discouraging a show at some of these committees where a, a lot of the times the media are sitting around thinking, why didn't you ask this question? Why aren't, why aren't you pursuing the particular line of research? Uh, so again, I think it, it, it's, that speaks more to what's wrong with our um, committee uh, system and why people aren't doing the kind of research that they, that they need to do on important policy issues. John. Well, it was particularly insensitive. I mean, I don't, I don't think the visuals for the Conservatives have been good on this. The two parliamentary secretaries, Bob Deckert and uh, Gauguin, are men of a certain age. Uh, they parachuted in two women onto that committee who were not normal members of, of the committee, Stella Ambler and Joy Smith, to put a more uh, friendly face, if you like. But I don't think it worked for them. And, and clearly, for, for somebody whose job it is is to appear sympathetic in the public eye, uh, he didn't do a very good job. Tasha? Yeah, it was, I mean, it was completely ham-fisted. It was, it was not a good choice of words by any stretch. I don't know if there was a language issue here or not, but honestly, uh, to, to, to bring freedom of expression into that scenario uh, was, was distasteful. I don't think the government won points there. Definitely not. Um, but I don't know if they're, if they're losing points throughout this, this process. I don't think, first of all, it is the summer Canadians are paying rapt attention to these hearings. And I think that, if anything, um, you know, they should avoid clips like that. But the other ones of McKay coming out, for example, previously and saying, you know, ideally I'd like to see abolition. I think that, like I said, will resonate well with some voters. All right, let's get through the other two issues. Uh, it's summer barbecue season. We saw the clip earlier of Stephen Harper uh, roasting Justin Trudeau. <laughs> then you've caught, of course, Tom Mulcair making some news when he wanted to tour the flood zone in Manitoba, and he said that the Minister of Defense said no. Uh, Mr. Trudeau's obviously on the tour. Uh, real quick, I'll start again with you, Jennifer. Uh, here we are. It seems to be the time when they're test driving a lot of their election campaign lines. Absolutely. But you know what, Evan? I actually think this is a bit of a, of a lull between two busy seasons. So we had some by-elections uh, the week before last. We have this barbecue circuit season, but I think the fall is really when you're going to see the boom with a lot of political advertising. Um, you, you're going to see people really ramping up for the election. I mean, they, they go to this Calgary Stampede every year. They do these types of things. Um, I think what, where the Canadians are going to really notice that the election is coming is in the fall and uh, not right now in the summer. All right, the big boom comes in the fall. John, where are you? Well, I, I, a couple of points on that. One, uh, first of all, Thomas Mulcair's name was not mentioned, which I think is very telling. Um, I think Harper... We got a glimpse behind the kimono almost. He said, uh, people are telling me I've got to test run some of these lines. The next election is not too far away, which was kind of interesting. And he went very hard on Trudeau. He said, there's absolutely nothing of substance uh, in this guy and uh, lambasted the liberal policy on crime. The third thing that interested me, I saw a letter in the Calgary Herald today from, uh, from somebody who said, uh, lam he, he was lamenting the lack of political choices, but he said, at least Trudeau appears energetic, which is more than Harper does, who's he's standing up there uh, sending me to sleep. Tasha, real quick on this one. I don't know. I think, you know, I think the reason Thomas Mulcair didn't get to see the floods is the Tories figure he'll never be prime minister, so why does he have to know how to deal with them? Uh, he's really the loser in this equation. Clearly, like John said, he wasn't mentioned. Um, all the guns are firing at Trudeau. And uh, I think, though, that Harper has to be a bit careful because the message, one of the messages he had was, you know, middle-class tax relief. The recent Ontario election shows that that message, apart from the messenger,
didn't really sell here. I got a minute here. I just want to get to Rob Ford in the news again. Obviously out of rehab. He's back at work. He's on the campaign trail. He made a, co a controversy when he didn't stand up for the ovation that all other councillors gave for World Pride Day. Millions of people came to Toronto. Then just today, he came out as the lone voice against a proposal to find ways to assist homeless young gay people. He's been accused of homophobia before. 37 to 1. He's the lone voice. Real quick, can you explain Rob Ford's enduring popularity because still one in five Torontonians say they'd vote for him? Are you asking me? Because yes, I'm in Toronto and God help me, I still haven't figured it out. Fortunately, it is only one in five. That is lower than the last poll uh, before he came back from rehab. I think it shows why he didn't go because people were so happy when he was gone. We realized, wow, we really don't miss him. Um, but yes, there's that core vote. I think, again, that goes to the, the fear of returning to the previous administration, which was a spendaholic situation. Jennifer, real quick on, uh, on Rob I, Ford I, I, and, and, I and these accusations I, of homophobia. Yeah, I, I don't understand uh, the uh, one in five voters, if that's even true. Um, but I think it's completely unacceptable. John, last word to you. We, uh, you know, we, we all shake our heads at this, but then I think we're doing it to ourselves. I mean, we're talking about him now. Uh, if somebody wants to Google how many stories have been in the Toronto Star and the Toronto Sun since he came out of rehab, I mean, the oxygen of publicity is keeping this guy afloat. Uh, and they're all bad, though. All they're right. all bad. All right, <laughs> Tasha Carrot and John Iverson, Jennifer Ditchburn, i got to leave it there tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.